There's no greater monument to the might and the splendor of the once glorious Byzantine civilization than this great cathedral, the Hagia Sophia. Walking in is a sense-stunning experience, this great dome raised up above you into the vault of heaven. Almost as extraordinary as the sheer physical presence of the place is the fact that it was all built in just five years. In the past, this place was the most prestigious building of the Byzantine Empire and the centre of what came to be known as Orthodox Christianity. This building dates from the early 6th century and is a testament to one of the most important figures of the Byzantine Empire, Emperor Justinian I. His rule coincided with what might be described as the Golden Age of Byzantium a time of unparalleled peace and prosperity that made possible the very creation of the Hagia Sophia. The building of the Hagia Sophia changed the course of world architecture. Its massive dome, seemingly suspended in mid-air, appears to defy gravity, having no obvious means of support. The dome of this building is uh, 32 meters across. Uh, we do, of course, have the dome of the Pantheon in, in Rome, uh, which is larger, but uh, this is a much more daring architectural construction. Well, I, can, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about what someone from Rome would have thought coming to this place. They would have had the Pantheon in their mind, but what, what I assume would have struck them would have been that, yes, you've got a dome as big as the Pantheon's dome, but it's been sort of vertically propelled, <laughs> and, and it's surrounded by this other huge architectural fabric. Absolutely, uh, and uh, if, if you think about the Pantheon in particular, the dome is supported on a continuous wall, it's on a, on a drum. Here we've got something quite different. When you go into the church, it's very difficult to see just how the dome is supported. In 1261, after more than half a century of occupation by Western Christian forces, the city was once more restored as the Byzantine capital. It was an event that would herald the beginning of a last great artistic resurgence. And its centre was once more the Hagia Sophia. To mark the retaking of the city and the reclaiming of the cathedral, a great series of mosaics was commissioned from the empire's leading craftsmen. And if you want to have a sense of just how sophisticated, beautiful, subtle mosaic art could be in Constantinople in the second half of the 13th century, there's no better place to be than here. This mosaic is called the Deusis. It's one of the true masterpieces of Byzantine art. It shows the figures of the Virgin Mary and St. John the Baptist pleading with Christ for the salvation of man. It's typical of the final flowering of Byzantine art that followed the restoration of the empire in 1261. It's hard to believe that this degree of subtlety of modeling can be achieved in mosaic. These faces look forward towards the pinnacle of Renaissance art which was indeed hugely influenced by this earlier Byzantine Renaissance. Although the composition of the image and the poses of the figures are reflections of medieval Byzantine tradition, its psychological and emotional realism is quite new. With hindsight, it's easy to see all kinds of things in art that simply aren't there, but I wonder if there isn't some portent of the end of empire, the end that was to come, in the sad and solemn eyes of these figures. And they're just a fraction of what was once here. In looking at the modern fabric of the building, just occasionally you come across these little windows, so to speak, that have been cut into its mosaic past, revealing these beautiful fragments. It leaves you with a strange sense of not just how much has been lost, but how much might still lie beneath. By far the most complete example of late Byzantine art can be seen in one of the last buildings of the Byzantine Empire, the Kora Monastery. It once stood on the very outskirts of Constantinople, 
but today it's been swallowed up by modern Istanbul. The Church of the Cora is one of the real jewels of Constantinople because it represents almost the only surviving example of the late style of Byzantine art in the city. This extraordinary mosaic cycle was created in the second decade of the 14th century and it shows scenes from the life of the Virgin and the life of Jesus. Now if you look at the style of these mosaics, they're a world away from the statuesque, solemn monumentality of earlier Byzantine art. Suddenly there's this tremendous emphasis on action, emotion, far more figures in the scenes. Over there we see the rarely depicted miracle of the woman with the issue of blood and she flings herself at Christ's feet with this extraordinary sort of energy in her pose that we just haven't seen this before in Byzantine mosaics. Over there there's a very strong emphasis here on, on Christ and his miracles. He's healing a, a blind man, healing a dumb man, healing a leper. The emphasis is very strongly on salvation. And I wonder if this urgency, this emphasis on salvation isn't partly to be explained by this scene here because it introduces us to the man who paid for all this. His name was Theodore Metakites and here he is on his knees offering this splendidly remodeled church to Jesus Christ himself. Now Theodore Metakites was a man with a distinctly dodgy reputation. Some even referred to him as the emperor's evil genius and he was renowned for fleecing the poor to line the imperial coffers. And I wonder if paying for this splendidly remodeled church with its mosaics wasn't his way of putting some of that money back, of offering it to God in the hope of saving his own soul. But the Cora's masterpiece is in the inner sanctum of the church. This space is Metakites' own funerary chapel and he had it decorated, interestingly enough, in the much poorer medium of painting. Now we don't know why that was so. Could it be that he deliberately chose it as an act of humility or did he simply run out of money? Now once again, we see scenes from the Bible, figures of saints, prophets and angels, all in paint. But this time there's much less to detain the eye in these scenes. All the emphasis is towards this end and towards this extraordinary image of the anastasis, the harrowing of hell. It's full of an energy that we've never really seen in Byzantine art before. Look at that central figure of Christ. Whereas before, drapery might seem almost like a form of abstract geometry, here you really feel that there's a body inside that drapery pulling its folds apart as Christ, with great physical urgency, pulls Adam and Eve, the forebears of all mankind, from their tombs. It's the resurrection. He's pulling them into eternity, pulling them into salvation. And salvation is what this space is all about because salvation is what Metakites dreamed of. What I really love in this, in this picture as well is this fantastic detail that Christ is harrowing hell and what, what he's done is he's broken the gates of hell and you can see all this bric-a-brac, this debris, this <laughs> lock smithery. Those are all the locks that were used to fasten hell but he's broken hell open and there we see almost, it's quite hard to make out, but there's the figure of Satan trampled beneath Christ's feet. It's a profoundly powerful, energetic image of salvation and I think it's not hard to imagine Metakites contemplating it very much with his own salvation in mind. Now, another thing that's interesting about this space and this story is that Metakites' life did not end up being entirely a bed of roses. In the 1320s he was ousted from the imperial household during a palace coup. He lost all his money, all his power, all his privileges and he ended up dying here as a monk, a simple monk, in the monastery church that he'd so richly endowed. And I don't think perhaps that by the time he did reach his end he cared too much about the loss of all his power and privileges because his mind was not on the here and now. It was on eternity, on the image embodied in that extraordinary picture. Now, this is actually 
the last great work of Byzantine art in Constantinople. So it's not just one man's last memorial, last monument. It's also the swan song of an entire empire. The works of the Cora were indeed the final flourish of a dying civilization. The mighty capital of Constantinople finally fell to Turkish invaders in 1453. Christian art and architecture continued to exist under the new Ottoman Empire, but over the years the Christian artistic landscape gradually changed into an Islamic one. Cathedrals became mosques and minarets rose into the sky. Mosaics were plastered over or whitewashed. Works of art that had survived since the time of Emperor Constantine were gradually erased from the new Ottoman capital. And yet, the Byzantine art tradition might have been battered by centuries of turmoil, religious conflict, imperial decline, but it still survives in a multitude of powerfully direct images forms and above all faces so intensely eloquent they still seem on the point of speech one last thought unlike virtually every other school of christian art the art that began in the byzantine east here in constantinople is still alive and thriving not bad for a supposedly primitive tradition oh,